Um, one of the questions posed for this panel is whether questions of the current sexiness, the sexiness is my word, of African futures is whether it is a case of back to the future. And for those of you who are too old to have been read on or have resisted the diet of American movies, I think a brief explanation of that movie would be useful. Back to the Futures takes place in 1985, and in it a young man, Marty, is thrown back to 1955 and meets his parents in high school. But his mother, Lorraine, becomes infatuated with him, Marty, rather than his father, George. Marty has to restore the future relationship between his parents, otherwise he will never be born. How he achieves this with the help of Doc is the story of the film. What is particularly instructive for us is the conclusion of the film because it includes an invitation from Doc to Marty and his now in, back in 1985 girlfriend to follow him, Doc, into the future to sort out a problem between Marty and his girlfriend and their future children. We've talked a lot in the last two days about inclusiveness, the diasporas, gender, youth, and so forth. And yesterday, Aisha said we were already in the past. And I'd like to focus my comments on our futures, literally the youth, and I'm happy that some young people will speak after me. In particular, I would like us to consider the implications of a reimagined future that is respectful of African histories and traditions as per the reflections posed for this panel. Myself a latecomer to the concept of Afro futures. When I was recently invite, invited to join a working group titled Future Africa, Multiple uh, Futures Through Time, at the Bayreuth Academy of Advanced African Studies. I contacted my network of young people for their ideas, young people aged 15 to 30, 30 something. They were very clear, and yet when I got to Bayreuth, I spent the first half day confused in ways I had not been confused for a long time. I had barely caught up with Afropolitanism and Africa rising, and now here was Afrofutures, a concept others had apparently been working with for decades. If we don't prioritize engagement with the youth for the sake of knowledge building and sustenance, and I feel that I am surviving because I engage with young people in the academy daily, we should care because we have a self-interested need to survive. One, our relevance can only be sustained as we rebirth our DNA in the next generation. And two, there's the hard cause survival. My husband often jokes when we find a disconnected young person, apparently not very respectful or maybe ignorant, and he says, hmm, of course, these are the people who will be attending to us when we end up in hospital in our old age. If we don't nurture them, they will kill us. <laughs> Parents seek to reinvent themselves. We may believe in individual identity and so forth, but that's not a bad thing. Recently, in a meeting in Pretoria, um, some colleagues were there with us, our driver's unalloyed admiration of Malema was very scary for some of us, and yet we need to understand where this young person is coming from. Malema connects with him. For my purposes, there are two things about Malema worth noting. There's his connection and the fact that he is cool. We have not learned to be cool. Yesterday, Georgie was telling me about um, a talk that her son had attended at the Institute of African Studies, and the speaker was Professor Pius Adesami. And her son connected with Pius because Pius spoke the language of the young generation. <clears throat> we can learn something from recent debates about a so-called post-feminist identity. Beyonce Knowles has recently been called a terrorist by bell hooks. Flashback, last year Beyonce, okay, you all know who Beyonce is, right? <laughs> Beyonce sampled Chimamande Adichie's impassioned words from her TEDx talk on her new track, yeah. Flawless, in a call to feminism. Yeah. More recently, feminist author Bell Hooks expressed qualms about Beyonce's feminist perspective. Bell Hooks was particularly concerned about Beyonce's visual representation and her impact on young women. Hooks noted, and I quote, I see a part of Beyonce that is in fact anti-feminist, that is assaulting, that is a terrorist, unquote. Today, young women either don't understand feminism or don't want our brand. Younger feminists today adopt lipstick, high heels, revealing cleavage, and other body expressions of femininity that the first two waves had identified with male oppression. The attitude is, it's possible to have a push-up bra and a brain at the same time. My point here is that for relevance, we need to be willing to consider that cool is okay, even if we don't want to be cool, and to be willing to deconstruct and speak a language that the next generation can understand. 
We must be wary of the way we use concepts such as patriarchy, bourgeoisie, the state, especially the post-colonial state, neoliberalism, imperialism, fundamentalism, pan-Africanism. These terms don't mean the same things in the same way to the young generation. We need to give young people a reason to fall in love with Cordestria, with George in the Back to the Future case and not with Marty, to borrow from them. And who is that young generation really? They are the lost ones walking on the streets who become armed robbers in future. They are the ones who don't make it through high school and we look after them and they take their exams again and they end up in low level blue collar jobs. Then there are the 14 to 18 year olds in reasonably, high, reasonably good high schools, hungry for knowledge, hopeful, and with asking for a reason to believe in Africa's future. Children who recently engaged with Fatuso and Ngugi Wathiongo at a seminar for that purpose at the University of Ghana, and later with Tandika, where they lapped up and engaged on issues of gender, feminism, language, being African, the economy, politics, etc., showed us that young people are interested, mm -hmm. but you have to give it to them in a way that they will receive it. Mm -hmm. Most of them had never heard of Tandika or uh, Fatu, although of course some of them knew Ngugi, but they were very excited that they had met famous people who were old to them, but who made sense. <laughs> then there are those like Wynne, a young man I know, trained on the continent, and who is excited about advocacy and using film. There's Debbie, who started her education in the public school system in Ghana, moved to an international school, then moved to the US. She's not a music student, but she has a fantastic voice, and you can find her in the virtual world, singing her renditions of high life songs of older Ghanaians, she recently posted on her blog a piece and asked me to respond to her reflections on feminism, a dynamic piece, and yet she seems conflicted between her Pentecostal background and emerging perspectives. And she needed somebody to valorize that it was okay to be religious and to be a feminist. There's Papa, who has a similar background to Debbie's, also not a music student, and who sings. And there's one song of his that I'd like to refer to. It's called Kukwa. Papa sings an ode of regret and longing to his homeland, Ghana, captured through the metaphorical character of Kukwa. Kukwa is the name for Wednesday borns in um, Akan traditions, and it matches his own Kweku. Papa's own uh, Wednesday born name is Kweku, and the song plays out as a dialogue between the two. Kweku calling Kukwa, and he says, I've just got a scholarship, and I'll be moving to the dollarship. And then Kukwa says, you cannot afford, he says to Kukwa, you cannot afford my dreams. And then Kukwa says, please don't leave me. There are a number of others, we can return to them in the uh, conversation, but I'd like to just point some um, specific actions that I think that um, Codestria may want to engage with. One, creation of a Codestria youth chapter in some form, maybe some annual institutes for them high, at the high school level. Free membership for high school and maybe tertiary institution uh, young people and giving them a space at the AGM to speak. Three, updating our website and newsletter, populating it with content in popular form via social media, making the content look funky and cool. For that, you need a young person to manage it. You can get a volunteer and an intern. I've already spoken about av avoiding uh, jargon, and I think we need to include some of the young people in Tandika's uh, uh, committee. And I already also said uh, online membership, that way we can get the young people um, on board and avoid some of the situations like what we had in Rabat. It's been an honor and a privilege, thank you. Thank you very much, Akoswa, that was cool. is too young. We're talking somebody who's sometimes in their 40s. And yet people who are saying this were in their 30s and 40s when they became professors. We seem when we get older to see everybody as too young. I don't know what too young means. And that conversation between the generations has to happen in order for the relevance of Codestria as an organization, as well as the social sciences and the individual scholars work um, to retain its relevance. And that um, essentially was the point that I was trying to make. So that we don't become di dinosaurs as, or perceived as dinosaurs. That relevance um, has to be retained and we have to do it actively. It's not gonna happen by chance. It's not gonna happen by chance. We have to reproduce our DNA. Just the way a doctor gets excited when her son or daughter becomes a doctor. 
we have to ask ourselves, does the next generation want to be part of Codestria? Are we making them want to become uh, a part of Codestria? Do they know what Codestria does? Thanks.